Hi, everybody. David Guzik here. So join uh, me, join us for this uh, YouTube live uh, session. Sorry that it's been a couple of weeks until I could get back to you. Uh, I've been traveling, been gone a little bit. Matter of fact, just last night, I got back from Florida from a trip. And uh, pretty soon I'm going to be in Brazil. God willing, I can't make any promises, but God willing, next Thursday, I'll do this live broadcast from uh, Brazil. And uh, we will take questions and answers from there. So I hope it works out to do it that way. If not, well, then we'll just have to skip a week. We'll just do the best we can with what we can do. Uh, again, I'm very pleased that you, I think in the weeks since we've come and joined us, I can't remember if this happened right before our last broadcast or if it's just happened now, but I do want to say that we have now an app for Enduring Word out on the iPhone. The Enduring Word app is available for your iPhone or your iPad. Uh, it's great. It's quick. It's efficient. Now, at the present time, it's only for the iPhone. We hope to have it out for Android fairly soon. And for the present time, uh, it only delivers our text content. It's not delivering the audio or links to the video or such like that. We, we are still developing this. We hope to have more and more, but we're very excited about the response that we've received to the Enduring Word app. And uh, we're praying about expanding it and doing all we can more and more. Things are going great with the website. Uh, we continue to make progress with our translation projects and especially considering how to deliver our translated content better and better. Always appreciate your prayers on that. And uh, I'm just happy to be here with you. So, okay, so here's the scoop for this afternoon. I got a couple of questions that somehow either came in through email or I overlooked from our last session. I'm gonna answer those first and then I'll deal with whatever comes into the chat window. If you've got a question or a comment or something like that that you'd like to do, you type it in the chat window. And if I have an answer, I'll give it to you. If I don't have an answer, well then I'll tell you I don't have an answer. <laughs> we'll move on to the next thing. I certainly don't have an answer to every conceivable question, but I'll do the best that I can. Okay, here we go. Um, I somehow overlooked this question from our last live chat. It's from Joel Jimenez. Joel, sorry for passing it over. Believe me, it wasn't intentional. Uh, if I do happen to pass over a comment that somebody writes in the chat window, I'm sorry about it. I hope that I catch it and uh, can address it later. If not, feel free to ask it again. Here we go. Joel asks, he says, thanks for what you do. My question is, did Jews get, excuse me, I'm fighting back a sneeze here. Okay, now we're good. My question is, did Jews get baptized before Christ? And if so, for what purpose? Thanks. Wow. Joel, that is a great question. And it's touching on something that I have a lot of interest in. And in a perfect world where I had more time and where I had more time at home, I'd be developing some YouTube videos, a whole series on the issue of baptism. Because I think this is a very important issue in the present day, something that's not talked about enough. And there's a lot of different ways to approach baptism from the importance of baptism, the meaning of baptism, the value of baptism. Uh, but one of the things that I would stress is the fact of the biblical validity of believers' baptism and the, um, I, I believe, the harm of the idea of baby baptism or infant baptism. Now, I'm not going to get into that whole issue right now, but because of that question, because that question fascinates me, I've dug into this issue that you're asking about. Did Jews get baptized before Christ? The answer is kind of. Let me explain to you the kind of answer. First of all, the idea of the ceremonial washing by immersion was very important in Jewish culture. They have these ceremonial baths, both then and now, Orthodox Jews, that they call the mikvah. And this idea of a ceremonial washing, washing, often by immersion, is an important part of the ceremonial purity routine of a Jewish man or Jewish woman. So yes, the ceremonial washing is very important. Secondly, there was a particular ceremonial washing by immersion that was performed for Gentile converts, sometimes called proselytes, who wanted to become Jews. If you were a Gentile and wanted to be a Jew 
in the ancient world, I, I'm not familiar what the practice would be in the modern world, but I know in biblical times that there was a customary, specific baptism type washing that was done for that. Then a third instance of this is obviously what John the Baptist was doing. Now you could say that was in the, in the days of Christ, but remember John the Baptist began his ministry before the specific ministry of Jesus. And the Jews understood what he was doing when he was baptizing people in the Jordan River. So this idea of a ceremonial cleansing, this idea of a special ceremonial cleansing having to do with Jewish converts or proselytes to Judaism, this uh, was very much so. There was something of now, it's not the full charged understanding of baptism in the Christian world. The New Testament adds a couple of elements. It retains the idea of a cleansing from sin, a washing from sin, of course, but it adds to it the identity, the idea of number one, being dead with Jesus, buried with him under the waters of baptism and risen to new life. Secondly, it adds to it the idea of belonging to God's family, being baptized into Christ. So there's something of those ideas out there, but not the complete form. Okay, uh, let me get to one more question and then we'll start dealing with the idea of, uh, the th or not the idea, the things that are in the chat window. Okay, here we go next from Rebecca. She goes, this was too big for the live show, but in 1 Samuel, the people wanted a king. God told Samuel to give them a king. Why did God pick from the tribe of Benjamin when the sector was to be in Judah, according, I think you mean the scepter, probably autocorrect got the best of you there. The scepter was to be in Judah, according to Genesis, when Jacob blessed the 12 tribes. Why was Saul picked first? Was this to show the people that what they want isn't all the right thing? Why didn't Samuel know about the blessing from Jacob? Well, that is an excellent question, Rebecca. I'm glad that you asked it. Um, why? If God had prophesied in the book of Genesis, and whereas it's like in Genesis chapter 49, isn't it? The blessings of the tribes, the blessing of the sons of Jacob, when Jacob announces these blessings upon them. And the blessing or part of the blessing that he bestows upon his son um, Judah was to say, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. And in retrospect, we understand this to mean that it would to be from the tribe of Judah that the Israelites would have their um, uh, their king. Now, what I want you to understand is two things. First of all, you're, I think you're really on to something when you say, uh, was it to show the people that what they want isn't always the right thing? In a sense, yes. The first king over the people of Israel was, to, to use a phrase, the people's choice. Now, God chose him, but he chose him according to what the people wanted. God gave the people their choice. So the people's choice was Saul, the first king of Judah, of Israel, I should say, who turned out to be a disaster. God's choice. And I believe that I can't prove this. I think it's important for me to tell you what I can prove and what I can't prove. I can't prove this, but I believe that if Israel would have never chosen or desired or begged for Saul, God would have on his own initiative given them David in the right time. Uh, King David, the son of Jesse of the tribe of Judah. So yes, I think it was Israel getting ahead of themselves and God giving them what they wanted. And then in answering after the failure of that, God gave Israel what he wanted in the person of King David, the son of Jesse. Number two, Rebecca, I think you have to admit something here, that when you take a look at that line from Jacob's prophecy over his son, Judah, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. We look at that now and we say, oh yeah, of course, that means that the kings of Israel are going to come from the line of Judah. We look at it now and say that, but there are many prophetic things that aren't entirely clear before their fulfillment. After their fulfillment, we say, Oh yeah, of course, that's exactly what I meant. But there are many prophetic things. And I think that if you were to just take that line, the scepter shall not depart from Judah, that you wouldn't have an 
absolutely confident reason to say ahead of time that all the kings of Israel should come from the line of Judah. The scepter, well, what does that mean? Does that mean God's going to rule over Judah in a special way? Does that mean that Judah's going to rule in a special way? Is that What I'm just saying is that I don't think it's an automatic thing to see that promise before its fulfillment and to confidently say, okay, we know what it means. All right. Uh, I hope that helps you, Rebecca. Now, I think we got a lot of questions here in the chat window, so let's start getting at them. Okay, again, thank you for writing in. Thank you for participating. Thank you to our new subscribers. Thank you to those who click the thumbs up, the like, and those of you who get the notifications, all of it. Thanks for your participation on this YouTube channel. Look, I, I know we're not very big. I know there's not thousands of people who uh, are tuning in right now, uh, but I really appreciate those of you who do. And I got to say, I, I find it to be a very, um, it, it's a great part of my week just to sit here and chat with you about these things. Okay, let's get to the chat window right near. Hagen says, hey, David, enjoyed your teaching from the Occupy Conference a couple of weeks ago. I have the Expositor's Greek Testament by Hodder and Stoughton. It is a great resource. I've been looking for something similar for the Hebrew Old Testament. I can't seem to find much. Do you know of any good Hebrew language study tools? Well, Hagen, that is a tremendous question. And, you know, it's really an entirely different world today with study tools. It is because now compared to the days when I was embarking a Bible study, um, there's a whole army of uh, digital study tools that are available on many different platforms. Uh, there's Bible soft, there's logos, by the way, I know this sounds a little bit like a commercial, but I'll just let you know. If you want to purchase my Bible commentary integrated into a software system, you can get it on logos. You can get it on BibleSoft, and you can get it on Mantis Bible software for your uh, portable device, Android or um, iPad or iPhone. In any regard, these Bible resources, Mantis, Logos, BibleSoft, they have an incredible wealth of resources. And so you look in the lexicons, you look in the word studies. The theological workbook of the Old Testament is an old classic that is available in print, but is also. Um, uh, available digitally. It just walks you through uh, the meaning of Old Testament words as you come upon them. Um, using other similar tools are helpful. I'm going to look behind me here. Um, let's see here. Uh, what Hagen was talking about is something I have a very old edition of, the Expositor's Greek Testament. Um, I didn't know Hagen was going to ask that question. I just happened to have it on the bookshelf behind me. And uh, man, I love this because what this is, is this is a examination of the Greek New Testament, but it's written for English readers and writers. And so I, I'll be straight with you. I don't know of a similar resource in Hebrew. If one of our listeners or viewers does know one, please contact us and I'm happy to get news out about it. I want to do it myself, but this is a wonderful commentary. But, but Hagen, I'll tell you what I do is I do um, like to gain some knowledge from the Bible commentators who tip me off onto interesting and important things from the Hebrew language when I'm studying the Old Testament. So if I'm in the Old Testament and studying, again, you know, I'm looking up some of the books here on my uh, shelf. I, I don't have my exhaustive library with me, um, but for example, gee, I'm stalling for time. Just look, okay, here's one, uh, wood is a quality um, old, Leon Wood. He has some excellent Old Testament commentaries. Uh, more, I'm going to digital, so I don't have so many things right here. And another place on my bookshelf that I can't get to because it's a little bit out of reach, but I see something by Charles Feinberg. Charles Feinberg, excellent Old Testament commentator. He'll point out things that are valuable from the original languages. Um, as well, you get to know some of your good Old Testament commentators like Kidner, Derek Kidner, excellent. Um, Joyce Baldwin, excellent Old Testament commentator, First and Second Samuel. Um, uh, Mason does some great work on Job and a lot of others. And, and you, you learn how to value the Bible commentators who point out things from the original languages. So hope that's helpful for you there, Hagen. Uh, let me keep going on. Uh, good afternoon, David. Yes, good afternoon to you, uh, Pastor Jim. Uh, Neely says, hi, Pastor. Can't wait for the Android version. Praise the Lord, P.S., 
were hoping to start a small group on Christian history and were planning to play your YouTube videos if that's okay with you. Well, Neely, I'm pleased with that. What Neely's referring to is we have almost completely uploaded, I think there's two or three more videos in the series, but it's a 20 part series. 20, that would be 10 plus 10, a 20 part series on church lecture, on church history. It's a 20 part lecture series that I delivered as part of a church history class about 10 years ago. If you want to know what a 10 year before uh, a mid 40s David Guzik looks like, go look at those videos. Um, but anyway, I think it's a good series. And what's especially good about this series is uh, the visuals that I used on PowerPoint, those have been inserted into the video so that you can see the visuals that the other students saw on the screen. And again, uh, Neely, I'm very pleased to hear that. I hope that that video series is of help to you. Uh, praise the Lord. I'm happy to hear that. God bless you. Uh, Calvary Arlington Jim says, follow-up question, what parameters would you have as requirements for baptism? Well, Jim, that's a great question. What requirements would you say for baptism? And, and I would basically boil it down to this. A credible, when we mean credible, we mean a believable, a believable a profession of faith in Jesus Christ. And when we mean profession of faith, we mean a corresponding surrender of the life unto Jesus Christ. So often in the Christian world today, baptism is seen as an achievement. In other words, after you've walked with God for a certain amount of time, after you've uh, come to a certain level of theological understanding, after you've demonstrated a certain amount of integrity or maturity in your Christian life, then you're qualified to be baptized. Now, I understand that thinking, and I won't say that that thinking is completely bad, but what I will say is this, is it doesn't seem to be biblical. Honestly, it doesn't seem to be biblical. Check it out. On Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost, when 3,000 were added to the church, there doesn't seem to be a requirement of theological or life examination before somebody was baptized. They made credible, that is believable, um, expressions of faith and surrender to Jesus Christ, and they were baptized. The Ethiopian eunuch, there wasn't time to demonstrate theological sophistication or a certain kind of moral living or whatever you want to say, moral qualification. There was a credible, that is a believable profession of faith and a corresponding surrender to Jesus Christ. And we find the same thing with the Philippian jailer in later on in the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, there does not seem to be these requirements other than a believable profession of faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and a corresponding surrender to him. What I mean by corresponding surrender is I'm trying to get across the point that we're not just talking about a bare intellectual agreement that Jesus Christ is Lord, but really comprehending what that means. Not only is he Lord, I am going to accept him and receive him as the Lord of my life. So um, biblically speaking, now I, I know. I know that people use baptism, and, and might I say the early church used baptism. When I say early church, I'm talking about beyond the biblical church, but first in the first few centuries. It was common for early Christians to use baptism as sort of a, a marker of a certain level of achievement, or you've come out of the novice level, or now you're saying, I understand all that, but I'm just saying biblically, that doesn't seem to be the case. All right, going on. Thanks, Jim, for that question. Mike. When is the next time you will be in Pennsylvania? Mike, I do not know the next time I will be in Pennsylvania, uh, but I look forward to it when I can. I have many wonderful brothers and sisters in Pennsylvania. Um, last year, I had a blessed time at Calvary Chapel, Philadelphia, there uh, preaching on a Sunday morning. I also very much enjoyed my time with the Rock Ministries down there in the Kensington neighborhood of downtown Philadelphia, and then other opportunities I've had to be in the Philly area. I really appreciate it. So I, I don't know, Mike. Thank you, though. Um, Natty's K-pop love and happiness. Do you think the Hebrew Peshitta text is the original text of the New Testament, or is it the Greek Koine text? What Natty is referring to is an idea that the New Testament was originally written in Aramaic, which many people hold was the local dialect of 
Judea, of Judea and Galilee in the days of Jesus, that the common people spoke Aramaic. And there's some pretty good evidence of that. The idea is that the New Testament was originally written in Aramaic, and then it was translated into Greek. Natty, I, I understand this. I've done a little bit of research on this. I have not found compelling arguments to say that it was the case, that the New Testament was originally written in Aramaic and then translated into Greek. I think that this would especially be true of Paul's letters. When Paul is writing letters to churches outside of Judea, uh, even though you can make the argument that they spoke Aramaic primarily, now, many people in that day, just as our own, they were bilingual, so this isn't strange to us. But just as you would make the case that Aramaic was the dominant language in Judea, in this Roman province of that area, uh, Galilee, Judea, all the rest of it, even if that's the case, there's no way that Aramaic was the prominent church in Philippi, in um, Rome. So um, much of the New Testament we absolutely know was written first in Greek. There are some books that there's a little bit of debate about. I haven't seen compelling evidence to say that the either categorically certain books or the entire New Testament was written first in Aramaic and then translated to Greek. But it's an interesting question to consider. Thank you for that. Jordan. Hey, Pastor David, I taught on 1 Samuel chapter 1 last night, and about 90% of my message was from your teaching on Enduring Word. Thank you for allowing me to steal some of your message. Well, Jordan, um, let me say this. Uh, first of all, uh, it's not stealing if I give it away, so don't feel bad about that. But, of course, my earnest desire is that it was real and true in your own heart, in your own heart, uh, before you gave it out to others. Um, we can milk a lot of cows, but we need to make our own butter, so to speak. It needs to get churned around in our own heart before we share it. I'm delighted if I can be a resource and a help for pastors and Bible study leaders and all the rest of it. I'm delighted if my online commentary on enduringword.com, if it's helpful for pastors and preachers and class leaders and Bible study teachers, I'm delighted if that's a help for them. Um, but uh, I especially am happy when it's useful for people who are what we would call bivocational. They're working a regular job and they're involved in teaching the word and somehow. Because a lot of times those people don't have the time for study that they wish. And uh, if my materials are helpful anyway, I'm happy about that. But don't let it replace your own time with the word uh, as much as possible. Thanks for that though, Jordan. Uh, Neely says again, some Jews say, again, I'm reading from the chat window here on the side, some Jews say that the New Testament was actually first written in Hebrew instead of Greek. And so our Bibles today have many errors. Have you ever heard that? What can I say to that? Neely, I think you're referring to the question that I just answered back with um, Natty. Because people don't actually believe that the New Testament was written first in Hebrew. What they really mean is Aramaic. Understand this. Hebrew existed in the days of Jesus and was spoken in the days of Jesus, but not among the popular people at all. It was sort of the language of priestly ceremony. Here's an example. It's kind of the way that Latin might be spoken among Roman Catholic priests today. Now, nobody's out speaking Latin in everyday language, but we know the language exists and in a special religious context, it's used. That was kind of the same way that Hebrew actual Hebrew was used in Jesus's day. However, Aramaic was a popular language. By the way, th there's a lot of similarities between Hebrew and Aramaic. They're very similar. Well, they're, they're quite similar. Let's just say that. Quite similar languages. So we understand why sometimes people would just kind of um, casually say Aramaic when really what they mean is Hebrew. So it's really the same idea that these things were first written in Aramaic, then translated into Greek. Although I have read some theories that the letter to the Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, was originally written in Hebrew, not Aramaic, but Hebrew, then translated into Greek. Uh, again, I've read the theories. I, I haven't read anything that has been so persuasive to make me believe it as of this point. So. Yeah, that's it. Um, Jordan, also, will your teachings 
um, be added to the Enduring Word app. Thank you for your ministry, Brother Jordan. That's the idea. The idea is to the Enduring Word app. Again, you can get it on the iTunes store. There's no cost for it. Absolutely free. Get it on the iTunes store. Tell other people about it. We want it to be as spread abroad as far as possible. Not only do we plan to bring it out in Android, hopefully in the foreseeable future, but we also, also would very much like to be able to add access to the audio and video content on it. We just felt we wanted to launch what we could first immediately and then work on improving the app down the road. Okay, going on. Uh, Zaster, uh, greetings, greetings back to you. Natties, I love you for your pure doctrine. I love God making you teach it. Thank you, Natty. I love that too. Seth and Bobby, I listened to your study on Reformed theology. Very good perspective. Was just wondering, how do we preach um, election predestination biblically or explain it biblically? Seth and Bobby, that's a big question. Um, and it's not a question that I can write, go into an in-depth answer with on this particular question and answer time, but I can give you a general principle. And this is it. Teach the passage as it is in its particular context. Now, when I'm teaching certain passages that emphasize the predestination of God and the election of God, people may come to that Bible study or that preaching, that sermon, and think, this guy's a Calvinist. This guy's reformed. Then when they come and hear me preach on a, a passage that emphasizes human responsibility and the real choice that God gives to humanity and the responsibility we have in light of that choice and the need for us to respond to God in faith, when a person hears that, they might be thinking, well, that guy's not reformed at all. He's Arminian. What I'm just trying to say is this, is don't preach the so-called reformed passages as if you were an Arminian, and don't preach the so-called Arminian passages as if you were reformed. Let the passages speak for themselves and let God sort it out along the way. Now, we do understand that, that we want to understand the, the entirety of the Bible's teaching and have some of it reflected in there, but we don't want to preach or teach with one hand tied behind our back. We want to present the truth of God as it is presented in the context of the book that we're preaching it. And um, again, if, if it's a passage that stresses some of the themes that are stressed in Reformed theology, we might sound like we're Reformed. Who cares? If it stresses some of the themes that may be emphasized in what's sometimes called Arminian theology or non-Reformed theology, and it ends up that we sound like we're Arminian, who cares? I, I want to stick close to my Bible. Charles Spurgeon said something like that, and I'm going to give a quote from his, from memory, and I, I'm, it's not going to be literal. I mean, I could look it up and read it to you, but it, it goes something like this. He says, um, when I preach on the election of God, I sound like a Calvinist, and I'm happy to be called a Calvinist. He goes, when I preach on human responsibility, I sound like an Arminian, and sometimes people think I'm an Arminian, even though he says I'm not an Arminian because Spurgeon wasn't. He says, I don't care either way, just as long as I stay close to my Bible. And that's kind of how I feel about it as well. So hope that's helpful for you there, Seth and Bobby. Okay, Jordan, by the way, the high school group I taught loved the word. I'm thankful that the Lord is using you to help me in my ministry. Jordan, I'm very happy about that too. God bless you and your work with the high school group. Um, Zolly says, hi, David. How far can forgiveness go when speaking about a family member with substance abuse issues and with narcissistic qualities who takes advantage of family only for money? Zoli, this is a great question. And let me just give you a guiding principle. The guiding principle is this, is love does what is best for the one who is loved. And what I mean by this is, if you've got a family member who's mired in substance abuse, maybe harmful, narcissistic personality problems, and they're asking for or manipulating for or demanding money or resources for their thing, oftentimes it is not loving to give them what they ask for. And love doesn't say, I'll give you whatever you ask for. Love says, I want your best. I want your highest good. And if saying no to you actually 
as far as I can tell, if that is going to work towards your best, towards your good, then I'm going to say no to you. So that, that's the general philosophy I can give you with that, Zolly. Just the general idea that we long for what's best for other people. And love, desiring what's best, will sometimes, maybe even oftentimes, uh, compel us to say no to other people because that's actually going to be best for them. Okay, next, Neely. Thanks a bunch. I ask because my dad converted to Judaism and he said and insinuates some strange things. And sometimes it is very intimidating to debate him about these things since he's my dad. Well, yes, Neely, um, I understand that. And it can be difficult, especially talking with our parents about such things, because the Bible says that we're supposed to honor our father and mother. And um, sometimes, you know, the whole thing of confronting them in error or rebuking them, sometimes we need to trust that God will bring other people to do that in their life. But then there's other places where God really would prompt us to speak a word. I understand this difficulty, and I'm glad if these materials at EnduringWord.com or um, on the YouTube channel, if they're of a help to you in any way. Bless you, Neely. Nathan says, Hi, Pastor David. Why is there a difference in the order of the Old Testament books in a Hebrew Jewish Bible order, law, prophets, writings, and then the English order, law, history, poetry, prophets? Um, Nathan, I'm going to have to say, I don't know. Now, I don't know why there's a difference. I know that there is a difference, just as you alluded to in your question. The way that the Old Testament books are ordered in the Hebrew scriptures are different in a Jewish version of the Old Testament, which they would call the Tanakh, compared to a uh, Christian version of the Hebrew scriptures, which we would call the Old Testament. Again, they ordered it, just as Nathan said, that they order it as the law, then the prophets, then the writings, mainly meaning the historical writings. And then the idea in the Christian Bible, the Hebrew scriptures are ordered in law, history, poetry, prophets. Um, I can't, I, I don't know why, other than maybe this was a way of exalting, giving a preeminence first to the law of Moses, the five books, then to the writings and words of the prophets, then to the other writings that follow. Um, I, I don't think that we have any divine order given to us. Um, not that I can really tell. And the other thing that kind of, the, the question that I'm prompted to think about, they go, man, I don't know that. I wish I did know that. I mean, I got a book up here in my thing that could probably tell me, but I, I don't automatically know when this diversion was made in the order of writings. I'd be interested to do a little bit of research on that. Uh, if I were to do that, I'd look up something like um, the old classic that I have, a general introduction to the Bible by Geisler and Nix. Uh, that would be where I would first look for an answer like that. So I don't have an answer, but I think it's a very provocative question, Nathan. Thank you for asking it. Jim writes and says, I've heard you say that infant baptism does much harm. Will you teach on this sometime? Jim, I hope to. And again, I'm kind of organizing and putting together a teaching on um, baptism, both believer's baptism and infant baptism. What I'm finding as I do my research is that this is an area that impacts a lot of what we think, not only about God's work in the individual, but it impacts what we think about God's work in the church. It also impacts in how we perceive God's work throughout the ages in regard to his covenants. So um, I'm trying to figure out how much I want to talk about, how much I want to leave out. But uh, I hope to do this pray that God gives me the margin to do this. And really the idea is simply that, um, I'll just say this. I believe that there are many people in hell or on their way to hell who assume that they were saved because they were baptized as babies. That's why I think that infant baptism is more than just a wrong teaching. There's a lot of wrong teachings out there. We, we shouldn't feel like we need to run around and contest and correct and confront every one of them. But when a wrong teaching does damage, then I think we have a little more responsibility. By the way, there's another video that, again, I, I just don't have the time that I wish I did. When I do get the time, I'm going to make a video talking about this idea of divorce and remarriage and a lot of wrong teaching that's going around on that that's causing a lot of precious believers undue guilt and condemnation because they say number one that there 
is no remarriage after a divorce for a believer. They're saying, number two, that the only thing that breaks the marriage bond is death. And number three, they're saying that the only repentance a person can make from a uh, wrong marriage is to divorce that person. I think these are three things and many other things in regard to that are wrong. And again, when I get a moment, I'm going to make a video about that and uh, present it. Okay, a couple more questions here, and then we'll have to end it for the day. Um, greetings from Lima, Peru. Horacio, yes, thank you. I have a question. Sorry for the, don't worry about your English. What is the meaning of Mark 20, chapter 4, verse 24, 25? Well, let me look this up here. Mark chapter 4, I'm kind of bending around my microphone here. Mark chapter four, verses 24 and 25. We read this. And he said to them, take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. For to whoever has, more will be given. But to whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Horatio, I understand why you have a hard time understanding this, because uh, usually in a passage like this where the phrasing seems kind of awkward to us, oftentimes we believe that Jesus was using, was using phrases or proverbs that were present in his day that sound unfamiliar to our ears, but would sound more familiar to his first listeners. So even though the kind of the way it's phrased sounds unfamiliar to our ears, I think the essential point isn't hard to pick up here. Notice this. I'll read it again. Verse 24. Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. Jesus is teaching us that how we receive the word of God, how we hear it is very important. If we have the word of God spoken to us, either by what we read or by what we hear in sermons, if we have the word of God spoken to us, and if we ignore it, if we refuse to receive it in faith, if we do any of the rest of that, then it can turn out to be worse for us. But if we will receive the word of God with faith and with obedience, God will guide us into more of his truth. That's why it says, for to whoever has, to him more will be given, but to whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. The more we receive rightly and respond rightly to God's word, the more of his word and his truth he's going to reveal to us. The less we do it, the less we're going to have. That's the general principle there, even though I would agree it's phrased a little awkwardly. Uh, I hope that's helpful for you there, Horatio. Okay, last couple of questions here. Um, a witness says, your position on election and hu uh, human responsibility has been labeled Calminian. Well, whatever. I, I, I understand that. You know, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to say it bothers me. Does it not bother me? It just doesn't matter to me. As Spurgeon said, I'm just going to try to stick close to my Bible. And um, sure, just, just try to focus more on having a biblical theology than one that is uh, organized into a system and, and maybe tries to mold the biblical evidence a little bit more into its um, platform. Okay, and then finally, Hagen says, a few years back, I was given a packet that I think was written by you on how you put a message together. I have lost it and was trying to find it online and had no luck, any ideas. Hagen, in the comments to this video uh, or direct message, whatever you wanna do, Send me your email address. I think I know what you're talking about, and I'll email you a link to that. And I hope that'll be helpful for you. Uh, Paul, who I just saw in Florida, um, I saw you delete your message, but I just want to say it's great to hear your name. See, it was great seeing you a few days ago in, in um, Florida. Thanks for your encouragement, brother. I really appreciated that. All right, we're going to wrap it up right here, right now. Um, if you have further questions, you can feel free to leave them in the comments, to write them. Uh, you know, somewhere on this message board in YouTube. I hope to get to them. Uh, sometimes I get behind and I have to go back and look for the questions that have been offered and see what I can do to get caught up. But uh, it's my heart to get to as many of these as I can. I'm so grateful that you could join me, grateful for liking, grateful for new subscribers, of which we have many. And I'm especially grateful to those who support the work of Enduring Word 
Uh, again, I think God's doing something through these online Bible resources available in English, Spanish, and in an increasing number of other languages. Uh, and it's because God puts it on people's heart to get behind the work and to partner with us. And thank you for doing that, those of you. And, and just thank you for those who pray and have an interest in what God's doing with this. I hope to be with you again next Thursday, God willing. Um, I can't make promises, but God willing and the internet connection providing, uh, I'll be with you from Brazil. Uh, so let's see what happens with that. So God bless you. And thanks for joining us today on this live question and answer.